everybody, and welcome to the world's favorite youth baseball podcast, Clearing the Bases, featuring Coach Jimmy, Phil, and Jerry. I'm David Friedman. I want to thank you for coming along this ride with us. How are we doing today, Coach? Doing good, Dave. We're finishing up all of our preseason stuff, scrimmage games, practices, and we open the season on Monday. Yeah, us too. Looking forward to it. Uh, so Jimmy and I arranged a scrimmage between our two squads this weekend. And other than us freezing our our butts <laughs> off, uh, it was very good. It was very good competitive scrimmage. It was um, it was it was nice to to be on the opposite side of the field in the old uh, CTB war. <laughs> that's funny i never i never looked at it like the ctb war that's interesting this yeah. may have to be an annual occurrence moving forward yeah that would be awesome have our, our last scrimmage of the year be the uh the, the battle of the the battle of the microphones here <laughs> i think that it was a great thing that we we were able to in the spirit of good sportsmanship that we're able to get together, put our boys on the field, help each other out and, and get each other ready for the season. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it worked, everything worked out really, really well. I, I think it was some good learning from both sides. Uh, we saw some good action from both sides. We saw some actionable items from both sides that uh, <laughs> and sure. you and I talked about helping each other out with suggestions. So it's almost like that's what baseball should be. Oh my God. Is that what it really is? <laughs> it seems like maybe maybe we we came upon a, a new wild and exciting idea. Good good competition, good sportsmanship, and being able to smile and uh, give a hug after the game is over. Yeah, there should be much more of that in, in the baseball world, right? Yeah, yeah, um, you know, and it's 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 tough. We do talk about this fairly often. You know, we're we're in the Northeast, and conditions have just not been conducive uh we don't have we don't have a turf field where where my school is and uh we we're very lucky our, our grounds crew got out at six in the morning yesterday to be able to get a, our field in a playable shape and it wound up being decent um or more than decent it was you know it was, it was well playable but you know it's it's so tough planning anything out in the preseason up here where you just you know 60 degrees one day and 30 degrees the next day it's it's that's that's been tough yeah, it has been. It's it's you know, it started off the beginning of March where it was fairly warm and, you know, it was looking favorable. And then all of a sudden, my God, I mean, we had uh, a day. When was it a week or so ago where the high for the day was 27? Yeah, we were supposed to play that day. And and fortunately, the other team bailed because our <laughs> our district, we were we were set to play. And, and uh, when questioning like what are we doing the answer that we got from our ad was that's northeast baseball <laughs> yeah well um it, it's not going to be it's, it's not going to be very conducive to throwing strikes when my pitcher's wearing mittens so um i was yeah. we were very very fortunate to get a get a pass that day but um but it was good it was it was great to to play and uh, see what these kids can do against some stiff competition. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to the season. Yeah. You and me both. Now it's uh, now it's the real deal. Now there's no more hugs and smiles <laughs> and being <laughs> friendly. Now competition nope. starts tomorrow. Going for the jugular. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, um, so we're looking forward to that. And I'm sure over the coming weeks and couple months, we'll have plenty of stories to talk about um, because it's, it's a great source for material of things to talk about the good and the bad of what's going on in our sport that we love with youth baseball. And on that note, uh, very, very, very proud wow. and pleased to announce this week's guest is radio icon, Rick Wolf. He is the creator and host of the sports Ed show on WFAN the biggest sports radio channel. Uh, in the New York area, in the greater New York City area, WFAN. He's been there for over 20 years. He does a fantastic job. He's also done a million other interesting things in his life <laughs> that we'll, we'll get into a little bit during the show. But uh, this is a great get for us, Jimmy. Yeah, I've been listening to Rick for 20, at least 20 years, maybe even more. And it was really, really exciting for me to have him on our show to just you know, talk, just talk about baseball. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously he gets into, he gets into a lot of topics more, a little more, a little outside our regular purview. He does look at kind of the, the senior circuit for what we talk about with youth development, where he, he does get into a lot more of the, uh, the college age and uh, the, the upper high school and college age kids. We like to focus a lot on the, uh, the, the early development. Um, so it was an interesting conversation that we had. We got into some really good topics and um, I'm excited to bring this to our listeners. Yeah, so all my Dave. I think that there's there's a lot of stuff there, and let's face it, there's you know a, a lot of problems in youth sports in general, and that's what Rick's show is. It's a youth sports show. It's not necessarily a youth baseball show, but once uh, once we get into the conversation with him, he's very very knowledgeable and very much aware of you know the issues and the problems that that uh, we face at the youth level and the high school level and beyond. Yeah. And, and he just, he has so much, not, not just his own knowledge and stories to share, but he has so many contacts and so many people, the, the, the regular call-ins to a show, other, you know, friends of our show, like um, Jack Smithlin and Kevin Gallagher and Jeff Fry and guys like that, that we've had on, we've had great conversations with here. You know, he talks to these guys all the time and as well as many, many others, um, so his perspective is not just his own history, but those of, of those that he's made contact with. So it wound up being uh, really good. It's something I wish we could have had him for three more hours. I don't think we ever would have ran out of material, but uh, we're very thankful that he gave us the time that he did. And uh, let's take it away with Rick Wolf. So, Rick, you've been a college coach, professional baseball player. You're a Harvard graduate sports psychology expert, author, Emmy Award winner, radio talk show host. Why are you such an underperformer? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. (laughs) What I would like to know is, with all of those accolades, when you started your radio talk show, what made you decide to do it on youth sports and parenting? I think the year was 1998. So we're talking, you know, last century, quite frankly. <laughs> and uh, back in the in the early 90s, I was working for the uh, Cleveland Indians as their as their roving sports psychology coach. And uh, in the early 90s, my wife Trish and I we were uh, blessed with three kids, and they were young and just getting involved in in sports as youngsters do. But it was apparent to me, even in the early nineties, that the really, in those days, parents were really, sports parents were really out of control. And uh, there was no no oversight, no, no sort of mandates, no nothing. It was really, as I like to say, sort of the wild, wild west. And in fact, one spring training with the Indians, I remember I spent a day walking around talking to a number of the of the big leaguers and to a man, regardless of where they grew up, whether they grew up either in Florida or Texas, California, wherever, every one of them said that uh, they had grown up in a time where uh, youth sports were pretty much out of control. They had played at some point or another for coaches who yelled and screamed. Uh, it was really crazy. They'd seen a lot of fights in the stands. So I started to say, you know, there must be something to be, that's going on here of a national concern. So I, I, I wrote a book about youth sports. Uh, the book was entitled Good Sports, uh, about the issues and concerns that uh, I'm sure a lot of coaches and moms and dads and officials had about this, 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 this horrible situation. And that led to sort of snowballed into um, my doing essays about youth sports for Sports Illustrated. And then one day I was talking with Mark Chernoff, who at that time was the the head of programming for FAN. And Mark, uh, who I didn't know well, but he said, Rick, I I got kids who play youth sports. And quite frankly, this is a concern. And he lives over in New Jersey. And so we decided that maybe we should do a a weekly show about youth sports. I, I don't think Mark or myself Figured that the show would, you know, last more than a year or two, but here it is, what, 23, 24 years later, we're still talking about these issues, uh, and they just have multiplied, and they get more and more complicated, 
So there's a whole several generations now of sports parents who are who are interested in and in what's going on with uh, their kids and athletics and you know why why can't more and more parents and adults act like grown-ups at their kids' games? So that that's the long version, but that's what's that's, again that's been doing this show for a long time and have a decent following and get lots of good feedback. So that's why I keep doing it. Yeah, it sounds very similar. I I mean, Dave and I basically followed in your footsteps, so so to speak, with this podcast, because we felt that there were many, many podcasts out there that talk about Major League Baseball, college baseball, college baseball coaches, MLB players. There was really nothing out there for podcasts that discuss these issues. And almost like the same thing that you said, Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, that we figured we'll start it. We'll see how it goes. And man, oh, man, has it taken off. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, it is a uh, a national concern. I mean, I I, I get a lot of feedback uh, every week about the show, and and you know because people can listen to it either the podcast, which is basically a, a repeat of the show, or people hear it online and they stream it live. Boy, I, I get I get calls, and emails from literally all over the country. People everywhere are saying what what is going on, and as you guys know, it, the issues today are much more complex than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's just, it's just amazing, uh, you know, whether it's talking about college and high school kids now being able to sign NIL deals, transfer portal, why we keep hearing reports of, of coaches who just don't seem to get it in terms of respecting and treating their athletes the right way. It's, it's, it's really um, a huge, huge topic. It, it It's, kind of amazing where you've got a show like yours that is just insanely popular with with so many listeners our show is gaining traction obviously we're we're you know you know a blip on the radar compared to your show but so the 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 interest in the topics is there but why is that snowball still kind of seems like it's still rolling downhill instead of instead of coming to a stop well you know that's a good question dave um and i i think it's because we still despite all the debate and all the discussion, we still haven't found any real solutions uh, or answers to the, 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 the friction that exists between or among the, uh, the parents uh, and the coaches and the kids. And, and, you know, there was a time in this country when the parents did not interfere or intervene uh, on behalf of their kids. Kids went out and played, you know, pickup games after school, played you know, sandlot ball, had their own, you know, little, um, you know, games they played, depending mm-hmm. on the season. Uh, and the moms and dads were not there. The moms or dads were, were living their own lives. But over the last, as you guys know, the last uh, 10, 20 years, the, the, I, whether it's because there's now the sense that if my kid is good enough, then maybe he or she will get a scholarship to college and college is very expensive. Or maybe if they're really a superstar, maybe they'll turn pro and make millions of dollars. So it's hard to say what sort of ignited all this, but clearly, no matter what town or community you go to in this country, you're going to find that sports, youth sports, is a big, big deal. And parents, if their kid shows even a flicker of athletic ability, parents are going to say, well, this is my golden ticket, um, and I'll do what I can to ensure that my youngster gets a a leg up or a step ahead on, on his or her peers to get that, that, that golden ticket to, um, to college or the pro ranks. And I, I, you know, the parents are not stupid. You you sit down, I I do a lot of uh, presentations on this to communities and I, the parents, they know intellectually (laughs) that the odds of any kid even making any college team, much less division one is like, you know, less than, than uh, 4%. Of all heart, right. of all varsity ice athletes ever make a college team. Parents know that, but they think their kid is one of those special kids who will make the grade. It's just, it's very, it's it just it's it's bewildering as to why parents don't put more of the money into their kids' education and other and just to save it. It's just amazing. Yeah, I I think, and we've we've discussed this in one of our earlier episodes. A lot of the problem is that. The, the parents, in, in the case that you just explained, become the evaluator of their own child's talent. And my belief is that most parents don't. I mean, I know for me, 
as a scout for, for USA Baseball, I have a hard time evaluating talent. But I think that parents, they, they, they think that they're evaluating their, their, their kids and they know what they're looking at and they feel that, okay, my kid is better than little Johnny that's out on the field. That must mean that he's a blank, blank player. And they yeah. force that and they push it. Yeah. There, there was a, a very famous uh, radio series some years ago by, uh, by Garrison Keeler about Lake Wobegon in Minnesota. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the whole premise of the show was that people in Lake Wobegon felt that their kids are, well, they're a little uh, taller, a little smarter, a little better looking than all the other kids in other, other communities. It's the same kind of mentality. No parent can can look at their youngster and, and be objective about their talents. It just it just doesn't happen. So the problem is that when parents are, especially when they, they, they progress to a travel or a club team, you know, the parents are saying, well, I'm, I'm paying for this. So I want to make sure that the coaching staff shares my vision and my, my, my hopes for the, my kid. And I, I assume the coaches realize that my kid is a, is a little better, a little faster, a little stronger, a little more talented than the other kids in the team. And so it's sort of, it sort of snowballs from there. And, and that's, that's, that's a real concern because ironically, as you guys know, when a kid gets to be 13, 14, 15 years old, and they're now involved in, you know, competition and sports, they can see for themselves. They now have developed enough maturity to see cognitively that they aren't necessarily as good as the kids they're competing against. Um, they just, they can see it for themselves. The parents don't. The parents, unfortunately, still cling to those those dreams they have for the kids. Well, I Jimmy, know you know, like, I mean, like, for example, I mean, you know, let's say uh, Stepanak baseball, which is yep. terrific baseball, okay? Yep. But when I was coaching at Mercy, Mercy College, and I had, it was a Division II program, and I had some, some scholarship money to work with, and I would recruit uh, pretty much from obviously the, the immediate area of, of Westchester County, but I also recruited from Rockland, from several Northern counties in New Jersey, from Nassau and Suffolk, from Fairfield County in Connecticut. I mean, the city, all, all the Catholic schools. I mean, I had a lot of schools to choose from. And, yeah. um, you know, you look around and say, well, you know, this, this is this is a pretty good high school program at Stepanak. Yeah, it is, but so is Iona Prep and so is, and so is uh, JFK. Uh, <laughs> Don't I know that? Quite frankly, <laughs> There were like there were like 70 high schools in Westchester County alone, other 12 or whatever in Rockland, even more in, in Jersey, even more in Nassau and Suffolk. Every kid there who wanted to get a scholarship was all league, all all this, all county, all sectional. They're all the same. Yeah. But, you know, the parents don't appreciate that. They just see in their own sort of way that my kid is a big, big star at their school. And they don't really appreciate the fact that there are dozens and dozens of schools uh, where there are other you know, big stars as well. It's, it's up to the, the college coach to make that determination who they're going to go after and recruit. But the parents don't see it that way. In fact, I had a conversation just the other day with a, a colleague of mine who said, you know, most college coaches these days, before they offer any kid a scholarship, regardless of the sport, they do their homework and they go to games really not so much to watch the prospect or the recruit, but to watch how the parents react at, at the game. Are the parents yellers and screamers? Are they, are they trying to coach their kid from the stands and the sidelines? Are they trying to berate the, uh, the umpires or the officials? I got to tell you, mo a lot more college coaches these days saying, saying I, do I, I, I like this kid. I like the kid's talent. But do I want to bring this kid and his parents into yeah. my program? I mean, that's it's not that's worth the concern. headache. Of course, yeah, it's not, not worth I mean, the headache to, to put up with the kid. Yeah, and and I got I got to tell you, Dave, this is this is coaches are not doing this. I mean, I remember reading a quote from a few years ago when the the uh, Seattle Seahawks coach Pete Carroll used to be coaching head coach at USC, and he had said one of the reasons why I left uh, USC uh, to go to the NFL is just because. Quite frankly, I was tired with dealing with all the parents calling me up after games about their kids' playing time in, in college. Yeah, this is the world which we live in, and you know, I, I don't I don't know how to get around that. I mean, you can we can educate parents, but uh, they don't say, yeah, I, I I try to behave myself, but you understand, Rick, my kid's a superstar. 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's fine for everybody else, but exactly. my kids. <laughs> yeah, except oh, look, Rick. You know, I, I can't speak on behalf of of Jimmy or Dave. They got they got nice kids, but my kid is the star of the team. You know. So. <laughs> Well, well, something you said reminded me of a story that I heard years ago, and I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. Um, it was actually a story about a, and I believe it was Boston College, the football coach, where first day of practice, you know, all of the new recruits came in and he lined everybody up shoulder to shoulder. And he said, listen, guys, everybody here that was all conference stepped forward. The whole team yeah. went. Everybody here who was all state step forward boom all league all this boom 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 the guys kept stepping forward he goes this is great he said you would think we have the best football team here look at all you guys all state all conference he goes you know what it means to me absolutely nothing he said now we're going to see who the football the players are yeah i mean i i can actually personally echo that because um you know 100 years ago when i was in high school and i was <laughs> i was a pretty decent wide receiver um and uh, scored a lot of touchdowns and so on and so forth. And uh, I was sort of, you know, recruited by a number of, uh, of the Ivy League schools and, and what have you. And so I was obviously a good baseball player too, but I, I, I remember going to Harvard as a freshman. And in those days, freshmen didn't play in the varsity and thinking, well, how tough can it be to, to you know, just continue my football career at an Ivy League school like Harvard? How many good football players can they, can they bring in? And I remember the first day, Jimmy, I show up for practice. There was like 120 kids dressed out. And just to your yeah. point, just about every kid in that team would have been all state, all this, all that, all America. I mean, it was unbelievable. And they came from Oklahoma, Minnesota, Texas, Arizona, California. I'm thinking, really? I mean, this is Ivy League football, not exactly yeah. the Big Ten, but every kid right. there had real credentials. And they were, they were a lot bigger than the kids I played against that uh, – when I was at Edgemont High School. So, yeah, a, a parents don't get that. And uh, the sad part is, is that when kids go through that at the collegiate level and they find that it's no longer the same sort of rah-rah, we're here to help you kind of mentality at the college ranks because the college coaches are there to win games. It's not – the college coaches, once they realize they made a mistake or they don't think you're going to help the program – too many coaches there, they sort of turn their backs on the kids. And the kids are sort of saying, well, now what do I do? In fact, that's another thing, guys, which I'm sure you've heard the story many times of the kids who say, well, I wasn't recruited, but I'm going to be a walk-on at that university and I'll prove the coaches just uh, what a mistake they made and not, and not you know, giving me a, a, a scholarship. That's a noble sort of, you know, you know, I guess inspired by the movie Rudy, Right. <laughs> but the reality is, you know, most college programs, again, regardless of the sport, they're not looking to get any help from the walk-ons. Um, right. They just say, the bodies. well, yeah, I mean, they, they say, we know, we already know uh, who's going to be on our team. We've already recruited them. And quite frankly, if you're the college coach on a salary, it's going to look kind of awkward to you or to your boss, the athletic director, if suddenly a kid who's a walk-on is playing ahead of a kid who was recruited and is getting a scholarship. Right. I mean, Somebody messed up then. The AD is going to say to the coach, why is this kid who's a walk-on who's you know, taking out loans to be here and is paying his own way. And this recruit you brought in is sitting on the bench. If you do that too many times, the AD says, coach, I don't think you're very good at evaluating talent. So, <laughs> right. um, that, and then the other, like the other side of that coin is, as we mentioned before, college coaches who feel they made a mistake, brought in a kid who's not, not able to play at that level, they just sort of unfortunately ignore or turn their back on the kid to the kid sort of realizes he's no longer wanted on the team. And the kid decides, maybe I should just transfer out, which is what the coach wants the kid to do, but doesn't have the guts to tell him, I don't think this is a good fit for you. So. It, it's something we see, and and a lot of what we talk about on our show is younger players than than that. We're talking about rec ball and tra and early travel ball and whatnot. And Jimmy and I both coach JV baseball, so that's that's uh, a lot of what we talk about is our experiences with that age and younger. And at, at that point, that's where it's what I kind of I think I came up. With. I don't think I stole this from anybody, but I came. Up, it's the shiny new toy theory. 
where the coach is always going to be looking for that next, you know, it's great that you've put in the time and the effort and you're showing up every day and all that. But if there's another new shiny toy that comes in, that looks a little bit better then that's where my focus is going to be. And unfortunately that starts at nine, eight, yeah. maybe even eight nowadays. Yeah. 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 That's exactly what happens with the shiny new toy. And, um, uh, you know, uh, let's face it, uh, particularly with with parents and with uh, their kids on travel or club teams, uh, those programs, those those coaches are very good at, at at selling a kid as a prospect to a to a school to a school coach as a shiny new toy and, and so on and so forth. And that, that's fine. I mean, most of the high school coaches uh, will say, "Great, bring them on, love to see them," but again, they want to see the proof in the pudding. They want to see the kid actually perform. On a consistent basis, and um, yeah, well, let me ask you a question. I mean, what happens when you get a kid uh, at the JV level, and the kid's got some talent and some ability, and but you say, you know, I just want to tinker with this kid's uh, pitching mechanics, uh, or I want to work with his his hitting, and uh, the kid listens to you and says, Coach, that's very nice, but my my outside travel team coach wants me to do it this way, or my dad tells me to do it this way. Then what do you do? And that, well, that's I, a very common problem. Believe me, I know it well. I hear it all the time. And yes, it's a very, very difficult problem to address. And I, I can tell you the way I do it is it, it's, I try to be as delicate as possible because I don't want to tell somebody, don't listen to your other coach or your other trainer. I don't want to do that. What I'll do is I say, okay, this is, this is what I think. I think you should do this, this, why don't you try my way and his way and whichever way you're comfortable with and you feel works better for you, then we'll go with that. I'm not the type of person, and Dave, you and I have discussed this before. I'm not the type of person to say, you have to do it my way, even though I may believe that what I'm teaching you is right, but I will give you, I'll show you both sides of the coin and you, you know, as a player, you pick what you think works best for you. I mean, I think that's a very reasonable approach and a very, um, adult-like approach but again it's 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 a, it's sort of a it's emblematic of the times in which we live where the kid is basically telling you well that's not the way i was told or instructed how to do it which is no matter how you slice it guys it's a little bit insulting to you i mean you're the coach um and uh, in fact one of the you know i did a survey on the air last week about uh, the biggest concerns today and and i got a lot of Got a lot of uh, feedback that's exactly about this issue where too many outside coaches either find tend to find that the high school coaches are either uh, not important or not relevant to the kids' progress. That that's that's not the way it should be. I mean, I mean, yes. that's 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 not right. And um, you know, I, I again, I worry. Because we all know that uh, high school coaches uh, are trying to do the best for the kids. Uh, they want to, you know, see them progress and get better, and so on and so forth. But it, it's hard to sort of get their attention sometimes when they have somebody in their ear or telling their their parents that, yeah, we'll get you to a really good coach this coming summer. And that that's right. not the way it should be done. Keep in mind, a lot of those private coaches, their whole pitch is about we're going to get you to D1 baseball. We're going to get you to there. So you, you have to listen to me. Anybody else that's telling you, you know, you have to do it this way. If you do what I tell you, we're going to get you to D1 baseball. And it's, it's hard to battle against that, you know, when they're paying thousands of dollars to, to get that instruction. Uh, that is exactly the essence of the problem because the travel or club team coach and they look, they, 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 they I'm sure they have some coaching ability, and I definitely want the best for that youngster. But mm -hmm. but when they say to you, to the kid or the kid's parents, that I could see you really just blossoming uh, and becoming a D1 prospect, just listen to me and we'll get you there. But you got to listen to what I'm telling you here because I'm not sure your high school coach knows exactly just how good you could be. That's that's, that's tough to, to, to get around that issue. And you know, I, you know, you look at the, the, the travel the club team websites and they're full of like, we had this kid, this kid went D1, this kid. Yeah, but really, I mean, check, let's, let's do some homework and check that's all legit. I'm not sure it always is. So I get I a get, lot of complaints from parents who say, what do I do? I was misled. I, I, 
you don't there's right. no place to go you can't, you can't get the, your money back you can just the cows out the, the, the yeah the cows oh. out the barn door there, there's there's nothing you can do with that but the the other thing just to, to build off of what you just said about the places how they advertise all the players that they've gotten up guarantee uh, pretty close to a guarantee if they even if it was legit it was one player what about the other 14 kids on the team you know yeah. where did they go and that's that's where my problem is they're making the same promises over and over and over and over again how many of those times okay they're always going to point to that one that came true you know we got that one kid but what about I, the rest of the team I, I unfortunately this repeats itself over and over and over again and again, the parents, many of the parents are naive and the parents feel that uh, they will spend any amount of money now if it, because they want to be a good parent and give their youngster every possibility to, to accomplish their dreams. But sometimes the parents just don't know. They have no background uh, in, in competitive sports. Um, and as a consequence, uh, sometimes a kid just isn't that good, but from the from the coach's perspective, the travel or club team coach, they see this as a payday, and and they sort of say, well, you could be a part of the program, but when it finally gets to their between their junior and senior year, and the kids willing to be recruited, and the kid doesn't get recruited, finally the reality sinks home that maybe I'm not as good as I was supposed to be or as promised to be. Yeah. But by then, the, the coach's program, the program has already collected thousands of dollars from the kid or from his parents. Right. See, another problem that I'm seeing with club and, and travel teams with the kids that I do get on my high school team is there's there's no accountability. In other words, I think what's happening is the kids that are that are playing on these travel teams, they may be the better kids on their particular travel team. So. The coaches, like I said, they're, they're just not holding them accountable for things that we look for as high school coaches. And I mean, they're really the simple things like you hit a pop up to the infield. You better run hard down first base line. Don't run halfway down or jog or <laughs> and, you know, when I when I reprimand a player for that, they look at me like I'm crazy. Like, yeah. oh, well, coach was an out. And I'm like, I don't care what it was. <laughs> um, Jimmy, and I can, you know, I can give you a million examples of that. But you, you and I come from an era where we were taught and grew up thinking the, the most disgraceful thing you can do as a hitter is to strike out. Because you, what you have to do, you got three strikes, you've got to put the ball in play. Because even if you hit a bloop or uh, you get jammed or you hit a, a squib and you run it out hard, there's always a chance that somebody's going to throw the ball away or they're going to drop the ball or, or whatever. But today's generation of ball players have all grown up, unfortunately, with the influence of analytics, um, which basically dictates that what difference does it make if I hit a, a ground ball or a pop up? Um, it's, a, it's an out, just like a strikeout. What's the difference? And I, I do think that's a fundamental sea change in the way kids approach baseball today. Because they don't understand the, 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 the old school way of playing the game, which goes back to, you know, Kevin Gallagher and, and save the game and, and uh, you know, teach your kid to hit. Baseball is not based upon or shouldn't be based upon just throw as hard as you can every pitch uh, and get strikeouts. It shouldn't be based on just I take a, a swing from my butt, and try to hit a home run. No, that's not baseball. That's really just very, very boring. And, and very, very hard to watch. Baseball is supposed to be about a game of putting the ball in play, um, you know, making things happen, stealing bases. I mean, I, I'm, I'm preaching on the choir here, but you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But I would think today, for you guys in the coaching ranks, with kids that are young, they probably don't know what you're talking about. I mean, why would I want to bunt, coach? Why would I want to do that? Why would I want to move the runner along from second to third by hitting the ball to, to the second baseman? Why would I want to do that? I mean, let me hit a home yeah. run. Yeah, but... It doesn't work I just, I just came two hours ago. I was at a scrimmage. Uh, we, we had our first, uh, our first live scrimmage. Yeah. I, I, that's, I had that. I had a kid got a single hitting the ball between first and second, moved the runner over to second. He's on first. And I go to give him a, you know, a fist bump, like, you know, nice shot. And it wasn't the hardest hit ball, but it, it, it made it through. And he's just like kind of moping head down, <laughs> kind of moping. And I'm like, what are you doing? 
<laughs> there's nothing went wrong there. I, I, you're on first. There's no, you didn't make an out. How are you? Why do you have your head down? And just my head's ready to explode with this stuff. Guys, I, I think, uh, I really do think that um, the game of baseball could quickly uh, fall off, you know, the table because I, I, I the, the, the current young generation obviously doesn't play baseball either because it's just too hard a sport to master is on the quick uh, action. It's taught the wrong way at, at the little league level. Um, but, you know, the kids today like instant gratification. They like sports they can master quickly. Baseball is none of those things. And even worse, the, the big leaguers they're, they're trying, they do watch, they're just, uh, it's a home run or a strikeout. What's the difference? Uh, it's just really I mean, a lot of people over the years with, uh, you know, with lockouts and player strikes have done our best to kill the game, but we may yeah. have finally succeeded a way of doing this because it's, it's not the game. Kids today just don't understand. It's like nobody ever sat down with them and explained to them, this is how you play baseball. And it's right. so it, beco- it becomes incumbent upon coaches like you guys to say, guys, we, before we take the field, we got to explain to you how this game is played. There's a strategy to this, Yeah, you know? Yeah. What you were just talking about kind of leads me into the next topic I wanted to go to. And I I know that you might heard you talk about this before. We'll say that is. Is the education of coaches, I'm a big proponent, especially at the Little League level to have some type of training for coaches. And I know they're volunteers and we've discussed this on earlier shows. But I I see that a lot of the problem starts there because the emphasis there is only on winning. That's it. It's win, 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 win. It's not let's teach these kids how to play the the game the right way so that when they're old enough where it becomes important to win. And I don't think it becomes important to win until probably the varsity level of high school there from there up. But teaching the coaches is so important. And I think that that's, that's where we fall short. Uh, yeah, I mean, I do hear that, that similar theories that we've, re- we've now reached a time where kids today, when they go out to start learning the basics of the game, you know, in, in years past, either the kids learn the basics from their older brothers or from older kids in the neighborhood when they had, you know, pickup games or they had uh, dads uh, or volunteer coaches who knew baseball and how to teach it. But nowadays, those the, that that generation of coaches doesn't exist anymore. So the kids, whatever they learn how to play baseball, they learn from you know watching major leaguers, and that's not always the best way to learn the game. And again, we 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 both know we all know that it's 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 just so many different aspects of the sport that a kid has to learn, and it really does start at the earlier ages. It, it, it's. It's really kind of sad that that we've gotten to this to this point, and we have to figure out a way to sort of turn it around. You know, it, it's we've always seen a a decline with kids playing baseball around the age of twelve or thirteen, because kids either get involved in other sports or uh, the game gets more and more difficult to play and play well. But but for the younger age kids, if they know it's going to be a going to a baseball practice is going to be you know, learning various skills and running around and catch, learning how to catch a pop-up uh, on a windy day or when the sun is out or how to swing the bat the right way or how to take a lead off a base. That's how baseball is played or it should be played, but it's not, not, that's not being taught anymore. So by the time right. the kids get to high school, it's, it's, you know, you're, it's, you're starting, you're starting at a huge disadvantage. Yeah. I, I could tell you that even at the high school level, and I know you're going to think I'm crazy when I tell you this, but I have to do training with my players on how to get, how to take the field, how to get to your spot. And then when the inning is over, how to come back to the dugout because. I, <laughs> I don't doubt that for a second. I mean, you can't take anything for granted. Yeah. I mean, they, how, how would they know? How, how would, how would they know this stuff? So, I mean, that's such a fundamental <laughs> aspect of, of, uh, of the game. And yet I don't think kids have any clue on that. Now, somebody yeah. pointed out to me, the other day that kids today, young young ball players, they 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 look the part. They know how to dress out. They look snappy and sharp in the uniforms, and they got the you know the 
the batting glove in their back pocket, and you know they got the uh, the eye black and so on and so forth. Yeah. They look the, real Don't good. forget, don't forget about the sunglasses on top of the hat. You know that's you that's go. the most important course, part of it. You say, well, you know, it's a sunny day. Are you going to be able to fly a ball to get those sunglasses off the top of your head? To where, why would I do that? I mean, I you know, so <laughs> they look Sweet. the part. But then when the game start or the practice begins and they realize they don't have any clue on how to field a ground ball or how to run the first base or, or Jimmy, to your point, why aren't you running your, your butt off at full speed to first base? Yeah. And they come back and say, why? Why would I do that? <laughs> yeah. 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 They, they, they have no clue because they've never been taught. I mean, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, just what Dave just said, uh, during our tryouts a few weeks ago, there were a bunch of kids during the tryout. They were getting ready to do some running. And I don't know, maybe half a dozen kids had their sunglasses on the brim of their hat while they were getting ready. So I walked over and I said, how many, you know, I said to them, I said, how many of you guys have your sunglasses on top of your head? You know, and they raised their hand. I said, get them off the hat right now and either put them on your eyes or put them in your bag. Go. They looked at me like I was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and I'll tell you, well, I'll be curious because when you go out and uh, your next few practices on a sunny day, and this kid, same kids who have the sunglasses on on the in the brim of their hat, you say, "Guys, we're going to work on catching fly balls today," and you'll find that kids today just aren't schooled or accustomed to knowing how to catch a ball, or even more importantly, how to use their glove to to to, to block out the sun. So he, yeah, you, oh, get hit. You, you just you just hit a nerve because again, this happened in practice two weeks ago. We were doing we were doing outfield drills, and the way the boys were looking, they were looking towards the coach who was hitting them, um, you know, fungos, and the sun was behind the coach. Yeah. So I went over, you know, what I wanted them to do, this and that, and I started walking back towards the other coach. And as I'm walking, I heard somebody say, Oh, we got the sun right in our eyes. Rick, I went. <laughs> I went ballistic. <laughs> I turned around <laughs> and I said, I said, let's get this straight, guys. Okay. This is baseball. Okay. We play it in the summertime. And that little bright thing up in the sky does not go anywhere. It will be there. Okay. So I had to go over and explain to them how to shade with your glove. And I had to explain it to them. And how old are these kids? They're they're uh, sophomores. Most of them are sophomores. There's a few freshmen, okay. like maybe three or four freshmen. What I'm, my point being that, I mean, again, growing eight. up uh, playing in backyards and sandlots, I mean, I, I think by the time I was eight or nine, yeah, I, yeah, you, Easy. You know, everybody on the wasn't just me. Everybody knew how to catch a fly ball in the sun. Shaggy yeah. fly balls was easy because everybody could catch a fly ball. Right, and we didn't have sunglasses. Huh? I, I don't know about you, but I know we didn't have sunglasses. Uh, kids did not have sunglasses back then. You know, we, we, they existed, but nobody, nobody I knew had a pair. No. I remember when sunglasses became very much in vogue and it was just, this wasn't maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And it was heresy when batters wore sunglasses, the plate, it was just not done, but everybody could catch a fly ball. It was not like right. a particularly unusual skill, right. but today, Jimmy, as you pointed out, this is like, oh my gosh, the sun's in our eyes. How are we going to cope with this? Well, <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but I, I my, my, the point is that there are so many of these basic skills. I mean, how to catch a fly ball in the sun. Why do I have to run hard to first base? Uh, you know, how do I throw strikes? I mean, these, this is such basic stuff. By the time my kids in high school, you would think they already know this, but no, they don't. And, you know, no. this is this is a concern. Yeah. And the, the other thing, too, that you had mentioned earlier about bunting. And this happened uh, quite a few years ago. And Dave, this actually it was on uh, the the varsity team where where you coach. The um, I had a player on my travel team, big kid. He um, we were, we were doing bunting drills with my travel team, and he was giving me half an effort. He wasn't doing anything, you know, doing it right. So I can be tough on players. I, I you know I can if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, you're going to hear it from me. So, you know, I gave him a hard time about it. He says, coach, he says, I'm a four or five hitter. He says, I'm never going to bunt. And I said, listen to me. I said, if you play for me, you will learn how to bunt and you will bunt when I tell you to. Oh, okay. So anyway, worked him through. So anyway, he goes and he's playing now, not for me. He's playing for his varsity team. Runner on third base, bottom of the seventh, tie game. 
and he comes up to bat and his coach calls a suicide squeeze. He gets the bunt down, the run comes in. So about an hour later, I gave him time to get over the game, get home, relax, have something to eat. A couple hours later, his phone rings and it was me. And he picks up the phone. He says, coach, I was dreading this phone call. He said, I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him, I said, I thought you don't bunt, Mike. And he said, I do now, coach. I said, okay, good. Just as long as we learned. Good. I mean, uh, two quick stories along those lines. Uh, when I was at Mercy and uh, I told my players over and over again, there's going to be some situation in a close game late in the game where you're going to have to put a bunt down. I don't know what game it's going to be, what time, but if I'm, if I'm giving the signs to you in the, from the third base coaching box and I give you a bunt sign, a sack mm -hmm. bunt, so here's what I want you to do. I don't care if you're batting third or eighth or whatever, you're going to be angry and pissed off at me because I gave you the bunt sign, but it's the right thing to do for the team. So just, Call timeout, pretend you have to tie your shoelace or you got something in your eye, but give yourself a good minute to just, you know, vent your spleen, vent your anger at me, you know, focus. and then once you get out of your system, get back in the batter's box and put down a real serious sacrifice bunt. You, know, you yes. can be angry later on, but right now we got to win the game. And, right. you know, that actually worked with the kids because they said, yeah, I was pretty angry. After all, I'm hitting 315 and you give me a bunt sign. Yeah, but. I want to win the game, you know? So, uh, and with the Indians, uh, when I was with them, they used to really, really emphasize all the time, especially in the low minors, that if we have a guy in scoring position with less than two outs and you're batting, you have got to put the ball in play. You cannot strike out. They didn't really care if you got a hit. They said, hit the ball somewhere. Hit a sack fly, hit a ground ball, but you got to put the ball in play because we got to score that guy from third base. And um, they drilled at it. And when the Indians in the minors, I was working with guys like uh, Manny Ramirez, and Jim Tomei, uh, you know, really quality ball players on the way up. But in those days, they were just guys in the minors. But they all took that to heart. And I think it made a big, big difference because, again, it was. It was a universal mandate from the front office saying, this is what we're going to teach our guys, with runners on second and third with less than two outs. You must put the ball in play. Now, these days, of course, that doesn't that, that doesn't exist in the big leagues anymore. Ah, I'm going to hit a home run. And he strikes right. out in three pitches. But I'm telling you, it's, a, it's one of those lessons that kids really benefit from. And again, the kind of baseball we played growing up, it was all about, you know, putting the ball in play and, moving the runner along and trying to eke out a walk and stealing a base or first and third double steal or, you know, hit and run. And that's how the game is supposed to be played. But the kids today miss all that. They miss all the excitement. It's a shame. It really is. So we've gone through a lot of the, the problems that we all know are out there. Let's talk about maybe trying to come up with some kind of solution. I know that you do a lot of that on the radio show. You've talked about solutions and possible solutions. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Dave and I have done it also on earlier shows. But again, I'd like our listeners to hear what your thoughts are. Well, with baseball in particular. And again, this is to me, if your youngster has any interest from an early age, at, you know, swinging a wiffle ball bat or or, you know, running the bases or shows interest in the game, it's really incumbent on the, the coach, the, the parent, whoever it might be, uh, to sit down and try to explain and teach the youngster the basics. This is how you swing a baseball bat. This is how you catch a ball. This is how you throw a ball. I mean, if you guys know, there are several skills that kids have to master, but they're not going to learn that you know, instinctively, they have to be taught. Uh, now, if they have an older sibling who plays baseball, they'll learn from, from that one. But, but the fact is, kids, we, I think we assume kids do this stuff instinctively. And yeah, maybe, maybe in soccer, you know, you kick a soccer ball, all kids can do that. They figure that's, that's how you teach soccer. Or maybe in basketball, kids get strong enough to throw a ball into, into a hoop. But baseball is much more complicated than that. And you have to be honest with the kid as they get frustrated. I say, look, this is the most difficult sport of them all to play because you're going to you're going to fail most of the time. You're not going to be able to hit the ball 
or get a hit or, or do all the things you have to do. So they have to sort of become, become comfortable with that. But they also know that if they get sucked into it and they do enjoy the pleasure of hitting a ball the right way or making a nice play in the field or throwing strikes uh, or making a nice play in the outfield, they get into that. And there's something obviously to be said about the joy of doing those things, of mastering those skills. They're going to be sucked into the game. And then you go sort of from there and say, let me show you a few tips on how we can make things happen to win games, how we're going to, you know, scratch out a walk or put down a bunt or do this or that. So now they begin to realize it's really sort of a, a mental side of the game that's going to give them perhaps a leg up to, to, the, to defeat their opponents. And then, you know, that's how we, that's how we play. That's how we enjoy the game. Simple as that. One of the things that I, that I've, I've seen, well, obviously over the years, I started, I started playing little league baseball in early 1970s. And first of all, we didn't start playing until we were eight years old. And at that point, it was still instructional. In other words, all of the eight-year-olds, there weren't teams. It was all instructional. We all went together. We were all trained together. We were taught by a bunch of coaches how to play the game before we moved on to you know, being on a team and, and playing actual games. So that I believe that by having that instructional league kind of set the foundation. I mean, you know, to your point, we, we were out in the streets every day playing baseball anyway. So we had a lot of the skills being developed, but now, I mean, we had a show where they're, they're trying to, to compete with six-year-old kids. Yeah, that's, that's just so foolish. How can you have kids who are six or seven trying to win a t-ball championship? I mean, come on, really? The kids don't even know how to keep score, for God's sakes. And I tell kids, parents say, well, what do you do when the kid, the kid's six or seven and um, they come off the field and say, who's winning? You say, you know, I think the game's tied. <laughs> and the kid's happy. Right. They, the kids can't <laughs> even count at age seven. So there's no reason to have a, you know, just tell them the game is tied. They don't know. They're happy. They're not losing. It's tied. So, um but to your point, and particularly with, with the Little League, when the kids, the most terrifying act for any young kid is to go and try to hit against another kid who is wild. Sure. And uh, there have been lots of studies that kids, when they go up to a, into a game when they're young, their, their pulse rate is like 200 beats a minute. They're terrified because they don't know when the pitch might hit them in the head. Right. So it's still a very, very basic fear. The ball hurts. I mean, there's no reason why parents, the dads, can't go out there and pitch to the kids, even at the time they're eight or nine. So there's more action on the field. Parents don't have to just throw in the ball so the kids can hit it. Kids somehow feel more assured that a parent's not going to hit them. And I got to tell you, for all the poor kids in the outfield who never see any action, all of a sudden they're going to be busy because kids are putting the ball on the play. Fielders are going to be busy. Guys are running the bases. It's a lot more fun, and it's the game that's more comparable to what we did when we were growing up in terms of action all the time. Uh, as far as the pitchers, fine. You have you take your pitchers, you develop them in the, the sidelines, in the bullpen, and you basically tell a kid, okay, you want to pitch, that's fine. When you get to the point where you throw 10 pitches in the bullpen on the sidelines, you can throw seven pitches for strikes, then we'll consider putting you in the game. But you, we're not going to put you in a game where you're just going to walk everybody and terrorize all the kids that you might hit them. I, you know, that's, it's just that's, common sense, you know? That's great, yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I mean, but again, the problem, guys, and you know this because you live in this, the parents aren't going to allow this. The parents are going to say, that sounds like great stuff, coach. Uh, let's do that. And then all of a sudden they start saying, okay, we've done this in our, our scrimmages and practice sessions, but now we're playing for real. Yeah, but the kids are eight years old. What are we, what are we playing for here? What do we win? Win the league? We, win, we, get, we get a new car? Do we get a, a $100,000? What, what are we playing for here? No, we're not doing that. Yeah, but how come you're so crazy with your kid? How come, what, what, who cares? I mean, we're just trying to develop these ball players. So they want to play next year. doesn't happen. It's, it's, a, it's a shame. It's really sad. But, you know, the problem is most of the kids, even that young age, they want to play with their friends. Oh, sure. And they don't want to go to the town next door. They want to play with their buddies from school. And by the way, that still exists, as you know, even at the high school level, where the kids might be a kid, maybe a terrific soccer player or, or a lacrosse player or whatever, 
a baseball player, and they say, you know, uh, I'm on this very super duper elite team, but um, you know what? I really much prefer to play on my high school team with my buddies uh, because it's more fun. It's more enjoyable. I'm more of a big man on campus because uh, nobody, except for the parents, nobody goes to the travel or, or, or club teams. Maybe better competition, but the kids want to play with their buddies and their friends. So, you know, and you, you know, when you get a parent, and Dave, you know this, you get a parent starts telling you, my six year old is is obviously the next Mickey Mantle. I mean, and he should be playing with the eight years old. Come on now, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, and that was my take on, and this is going back again, our local league. I was on the board. So I was one of the ones that had to make the decision on whether or not we were going to let this kid play up and all this. And it was just like, well, why doesn't that guy, if this guy is so good at training his kid, why doesn't he then spend that effort on a team and get them up to speed? You know, like, you know, this is, this is town ball. This is, this is perfect. And this is, to me, it was kind of like, Oh, we'll feed his ego. Cause obviously he's got a big ego here. And that's another topic Jimmy and I talk about all the time with coaches. So this guy's got a big ego. So why don't we, we'll, we'll feed, Hey, you're yeah. You've worked so well with this, with your kid. You should be able to do that with, you know, 10 kids at a time. So let's, let's do that and get on a team. And it was, Oh no, no, no. I, I, I don't have time to coach. I don't, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that. And, yeah. Uh, it, so it's, you want it's me so... to coach your kid uh, to the level right. that you expect. I mean, come on. Parental right. expectations are out of control. And usually it's from it's from parents, uh, very modally dads, who don't really know how good one has to be to get to uh, the varsity level or even the co- collegiate level. It's, it's, they don't understand how difficult it may be. And the other thing, too, about this is that, you know, which is never talked about, is the impact of adolescence. You know, kids... The kids get to be 13 years old and right. they, you know, they go through growth spurts. Everything changes. Everything. I mean, my son uh, played a lot of uh, travel hockey as a kid and um, he used to play a team locally uh, and they had a very, very big kid who had, from the time he was eight or nine, he dominated all the games because he was a, he was a, he was a man against boys, Right. but he'd obviously gone through his growth spurt early in his life and by the time my son and his buddies were playing against the same kid, by the time they were teenagers, the kid had already sort of plateaued out. All the other kids grew up and got bigger and stronger. And so he was, the kid sort of peaked when he was like 10 or 11, but he was just an average player in high school. Mm-hmm. I, parents don't get that. I mean, it's just, it's just one of these things where they don't understand that things change dramatically. And, you know, kids who are short get tall. Kids who are who are fat get thin, kids who are slow get fast, everything changes. So why would you want to bank on a kid when they're, you know, nine years old that they're going to be a star? I mean, it's just, right. it's really weird. Um, but again, it's not, it's not so much the, 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 the parents who were pretty good athletes and played varsity ball in high school and played maybe some in college or maybe some pro, they're not the ones who are usually so so out of control it's the other parents who whether they are you know the old expression of living vicariously through their kids that's right. the problem but uh the good coaches and the good parents do know how to keep this all in perspective and um they're more focused on trying to get the kids to stay with the sport to give the kids a pat in the back to show they're making progress look how much you've gotten better from last year you know let's watch the video look last year you couldn't do this now you look like a pro you know Last year you couldn't catch a ball. Now you're looking like uh, you're, you're an all-star first baseman, you know, catching balls in the dirt, stuff like that. Parent, the kids need to have a solid, as you guys know, a solid line of positive feedback because right. they may not be getting that at home. They may not be hearing that. So right, yeah, I mean, a positive feedback is huge. How how did John Wooden used to do it? He would he would build you up, correct you, and then build you up again. I forgot what he called it. He called it a uh, praise sandwich or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the praise sandwich. And, and he would always say, for every piece of constructive criticism, you got to give the kid four pretty good slices of praise. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, think about John Wood, and of course, one of the all time greats, you know, he, he, he was never a yeller and screamer. In fact, he deliberately would speak softly. So everybody had to sort of lean in to see what he was saying. <laughs> pretty funny. <laughs> But, um, you know, there, there are lots and lots of great coaches still out there and lots of parents who still get it, which means we still have lots of great athletes coming to the system. But I do wonder how many more kids, particularly baseball, 
leave the sport because I just figure this is just, this is not fun. It's too hard to play. I'm not getting the kind of right feedback. Um, or the sport has unfortunately left them in a situation where they don't know how to adjust or adapt. And that, that is a real concern. So, yeah. Yeah. Can it be done to change the, the environment of youth baseball? I guess it can be done. It's just going to be a very, very long road. And I know like Dave and I struggle all the time to try and find solutions to put out there to say, listen, if you do this, this way, or you do that, that way, that it'll help and it'll make it more enjoyable in those early years make it fun just have fun go out there and play and have a good time well you know the problem is it's not that the parents don't mean well the parents want the best for the kids and they'll they'll go deep into their life savings to get them what they need whether it's a really fancy uh, uh brand new baseball bat or a new glove or, or or you know private tutoring they'll do all that but they don't have an understanding of just how difficult it is uh it, it's just yeah, it's 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 impossible. So to me, I know you guys feel the same way. It's better if the, if the kids are just allowed to go out and have fun, and enjoy themselves and play the game like it's supposed to be played. But sadly, it's that's not become an uphill challenge. It's 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 just yep. not where it's happening. But maybe that guys like the, yourself can turn it around, you know. Well, that would be the best way to get the kids to come back is if they're actually enjoying what they're doing, if they're having fun and they feel like they're learning something. And they're getting better every week. It seems like a pretty simple, you know, pretty pretty simple formula to keep them coming back. What? But one for some last reason, story. We keep Which missing. What, it. One last story, and I'll let you guys, uh, you know, call it a night. But I will tell you that I played uh, summer league ball many years, years ago with a left-handed pitcher out of Massapequa named Rob Nelson. Now, Rob Nelson was a lefty junk ball pitcher, but he was successful because he was good at throwing curves and changing changing speeds. When he got finished in college, he was out playing independent ball out in uh, Portland, Oregon. And one night he was in the bullpen. And this is when Jim Bouton was trying to stage a comeback as a knuckleball pitcher. And Rob Nelson and Jim Bouton became friends and they were talking about how, how disgusting it was for guys to chew tobacco and, and spit. So they came up with the idea of, uh, of doing that with bubble gum and they invented Big League Chew. And, oh. you know, Big League Chew has become a staple. Now, sure. Rob Nelson must be in his early 70s now. He's still a very affable, outgoing guy. But <laughs> once he and Bouton were able to sell Big League Chew, I think it was they sold the, the concept to Wrigley, Rob Nelson realized he, he didn't need a job anymore he, because he was making so much money off the gum. So... He decided, well, I'm not good enough to play a pro ball here in the States. <laughs> so you know, I'm not making this up. Nelly went and he played pro baseball in, Aust in Australia for several years, played in South Africa, played in Holland. He played as a pitcher throwing curveballs for the next uh, 15 years all over the world, basically being paid by the residue or the, the royalties he got from, from the big league chew. I mean, he, he was extraordinary. He said, this is, this is baseball has made me very wealthy because I was able to do something I love. Anyway, he, he ran camps for years out uh, in Long Island uh, where he, he told kids, came to his camp, kids probably, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, and said, bring your glove and your bat and your ball, and we're, I'm going to teach you how to have fun playing baseball. And what do you do is have the kids come to the diamond. He'd get them to basically choose up teams. They'd line up on, on the foul line. Then he'd say, okay, take your caps off, and we're going to sing the national anthem, and which they did. And then Nelly went out and pitched these kids, and the kids just hit and ran the bases, and they had a ball. And after an hour and a half, they, they said, enough already. This is done. So there were guys like Rob Nelson out there who were able to, to, to impart that fun and joy of baseball, which I still feel somehow seems to be lacking these days. And, and you know, the parents don't seem to understand that it's not about what your batting average is or – whether you're batting third or batting seventh, it's more about, am I having fun doing this? Right. That's a problem. That's, that's a huge, and sadly, I don't think major league baseball gets this either. They don't under, seem to understand or care that they're going to lose an entire next generation of ball players or fans because they don't care about trying to teach the game the right way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, 
Rick, we can't thank you enough for coming on to take it for taking the time to be here with us. You know, something that I didn't tell you is, is I've been listening to you probably for the last 20 years on the radio. <laughs> okay. Years, years ago, my, my older brother, who was a coach, literally coach, told me, Hey, you got to listen to this guy, Rick Wolf on the fan, you know, <laughs> Sunday mornings, da, 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 da. He said, you'll love it. And uh, I started listening to you. Then I've called into the show a couple of times, but I uh, just, I want to thank you. It, it's been a pleasure. Well, Jimmy, that is so kind of you to say that. And, uh, you know, uh, when I do the show, you know, it's just me talking into a microphone and you sort of hope and pray that people are listening. But over the years, I've been blessed because of listeners like yourself, who obviously have been quite loyal, um, Jack Smithlin, um, another guy who's listened for a long time, uh, who I had never met, uh, Steve Callis, a guy who's been on the show many times talking about youth baseball. I had never met Steve Callis. I mean, all these great friendships that I've developed over the years, thanks to the, the Sports Edge on, on the fan. And it's just kind of reassuring to know that there's a huge, huge base of people out there who care about these issues as I do. Because let's face it, guys, it, it's the, the, the world of sports is changing and changing rapidly. And, and it's not always for the best. So, and particularly when it comes to baseball, which was my sport, and obviously your guys' sport as well. Yeah, I'm concerned. It's it's a huge concern. So, anyhow, guys, thank you again. Uh, this is, as you know, I can talk about this forever, but uh, <laughs> I, I thank you. Um, and yeah, I, I, uh, I, if we can do it again, let me know. This is great fun. Thank you great. so much, Rick. This has been great. We appreciate you spending the time with us and uh, good luck uh, in, in the future with everything that you're working on. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Jimmy. Have a good night, Rick. Take care. Have a good night. Bye now. So there you have it. Our conversation with Rick Wolf. You know something, Dave, the, the, the one thing that comes to mind after this conversation is we talked a lot about all of the issues, which I'm sure everybody that listens to the show is aware of most of them anyway. And we, we tried to get into solutions. And my takeaway from it is that with Rick's experience and his tenure with a show that's been running on WFAN radio for 23, 24 years, it was hard to come up with actual concrete solutions, which kind of shows that the, the road to recovery for baseball, youth baseball, is, is a difficult one. And it's, it's just something that's not easily solved. No, and I'm not a big believer in misery loves company, but it can be some comfort to know whoever's listening to this and the issues that you're seeing. It's not you and it's not your league. This is kind of where things are at. Um, so we do like to focus, especially at the end of our shows, we like to focus on what we can do to help. And to me, it's all about kind of the grassroots movement of getting people, more people back involved, more good people back involved with the little leagues and the, the, the Babe Ruth and Cal Ripkins and pony leagues and all that, you know, not telling anybody not to, not to do travel, but you should also still do your town ball stuff because that's where you're going to help the most kids. And to keep this sport alive, we have to have more youth development. We have to have more kids getting into the leagues, learning how to play the right way, having fun. And then that'll keep them wanting to come back year after year. Which is the most important part, right? To get them to come back every year. And I, I think that one of my major takeaways was that a lot of the stuff that we talked about was how the players are acting in this era, we'll call it, and kind of shows me that they are being misdirected, that they're, they're not getting the basic foundations everything is the flash and the look at me and that type of thing as opposed to the hard nose grassroots let's learn how to play the the game of baseball oh yeah absolutely i mean we could give a gazillion examples of that we gave a bunch during the show we give them i think during almost every show uh so don't want to get too much into that at this stage we want the show to stand on its own but you know, the things that we can look at doing, I'm just going to keep repeating the same things that we talk about again, get on when you're, when you're, when you're involved in your local league, that's a beautiful thing. 
you have support groups out there like Matt Cole's uh, Facebook group, Youth Baseball Coaching, Support Drills and Philosophy. I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, I know you are as well, and we will chime in on there when when it's uh, appropriate, when we feel like we have something of value to add. And I don't I don't jump in on every single topic. I don't consider myself a hands down expert on most of this stuff. I just know the experience that I've had, but plus what we go through talking with each other every week and the guests that we've had and some of the ideas and, and thoughts that come through that. Um, so that's a big thing. Jeff Fry, you follow his stuff. There's a combination of both good information and some funny stuff that's out there. And, you know, again, we like to make the, our show fun. We let, he likes to, to have fun out there with people. So, um, you know, getting involved in things like that, that's what's going to help this to, to go. Uh, join in the group, save the game, us.com go it out there uh kevin gallagher and jeff fry's website save the game us.com sign up with the petition see how you can get involved to help um, bring things together but it's like everything else it has to start with a good foundation and from there we can build on it to make sure that the, the sport does start growing again um it'd be a shame to see it continue on the direction that it's been going yeah and i i think the the thought of of debating the issues that we face is probably the beginning of the road to getting back to where it should be. If we can keep having these debates and have people from both sides, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of parents out there that may have valid points for reasons that they do what they do. And, you know, if we can debate these issues more and more, whether it be on our show, whether it be on Rick's radio show, I think that that's where it has to start. The conversation has to start somewhere. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm glad that we're part of bringing that out to people. So Absolutely. as we, so reach out to all of us. So Rick can be found every Sunday morning from eight to nine on WFAN in New York on the radio. Uh, his show is replayed. You can find it both on odyssey.com and on Apple podcasts. And that's sports edge, Rick Wolf, the sports edge. And Wolf is W-O-L-F-F, and you'll see it in our show description here. Uh, you can reach out to him. His website is askcoachwolf.com, and he's at Ask Coach Wolf on Twitter. So uh, go ahead and reach out to him. And reach out to us also, uh, as you know, we love to interact with, with you guys. So uh, we're at the CTB Show on Twitter. We are clearing the bases at gmail.com. You can follow each of us on Twitter, on Facebook, under our regular names. Just, you know, we love hearing from you. Our ratings keep going up. We're still listed at the top of uh, youth baseball shows, and we love interacting with you guys. So please remember, as especially important as we're getting into actual playing time now with real games that are going to count, make sure, keep in mind at all times, the only two things that we can control are our effort and our attitude. Give me 100% effort, positive mental attitude, PMA, and good things will follow. Final thoughts, Coach? Yeah, I want to thank Rick Wolf for coming on the show, taking the time to come on the show. And I think, you know, not that I think, I know because I've been listening to his show for so many years that Rick is one of the guys that, kind of uh, led me to people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Thanks everyone and we'll see you on the next one. Mm -hmm.